Welcome to Collegial Conversations with Diana Clark, the professional webinar series that offers clinical and personal perspectives on issues that are common, but often not talked about. Here is today's Collegial Conversation. Thank you for joining Collegial Conversations with Diana Clark. Today we have Dr. Ali Cicada joining her. Dr. Ali Cicada is a counseling psychologist and the owner of Houston OCD and Anxiety. She provides individualized evidence-based treatment for children, adolescents, and adults with OCD, OCD-related disorders, anxiety disorders, disordered eating, trauma, depression, parenting-related challenges, and other life stressors. Diana and Allie, I'll turn it over to you. So thank you for joining, Allie. It sounds to me like you tackle very light issues. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening to those kind of going, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. But we're going to be talking today primarily about OCD. For our audience, what does OCD stand for? I know we hear it around a lot, but what does that mean? OCD is a disorder, uh, well, it stands for obsessive compulsive disorder, and it's a disorder that's characterized by having obsessions, which are uh, any intrusive, unwanted thought, image, or feeling um, that produces distress. uh, And because none of us like to feel anxious, we're going to engage in a compulsion, whether that's mental compulsion, whether that's like a physical compulsion, like touching things, washing hands and stuff like that. Or sometimes a compulsion is just avoidance of like, I just can't deal with anything that would be triggering. Um, And so those are kind of the two components, the obsessions, and then you have the compulsions. So I'm hearing that and I'm thinking to myself, okay, we all on some level have unwanted thoughts, right? We all have unwanted memories. We, I, I would assume I'm speak. I would, I'll speak for myself. I have my own unwanted memories and unwanted thoughts and guilts and shames and all kinds of things that I carry around in my little backpack. What is the difference between somebody like me who doesn't necessarily engage in obvious sort of rituals but does definitely have to do something with the anxiety that those thoughts. Definitely. That's a good question. Um, and I always like to tell people that obsession, like obsessions aren't unique to OCD. We all have them. Right. You know, I nowadays rarely ever straighten my hair. So every time I straighten my hair, right. I walk out of the house. I'm like, did I turn that off? And right. or I'm a new mother too. And so I have a lot of intrusive right. thoughts about my child. Um, Am I like taking care? Is she breathing? Is she doing this? Um, The difference between somebody who has OCD and somebody who doesn't have OCD is this kind of need for insert need for certainty. So we call OCD the doubting disease because it makes you doubt everything. It makes you doubt yourself. It makes you doubt your abilities. It makes you doubt the future. And what it craves is a hundred percent certainty that nothing bad will happen. Um, So for me, because I don't have OCD, I'm able to say, I probably turned off the hair straightener and I'm able to move on without having that certainty. And I'm able to just say, I'm not a negligent person. I might have left it on, but I'm just going to keep going with my life. Mm -hmm. Somebody who has OCD has to have that certainty in order to be able to move forward. So that's kind of what we really focus on with an OCD is trying to live a life without a hundred percent certainty that bad things aren't going to happen. So let's take your example. You got up in the morning, you did your hair thing, you left the house, you were at a light maybe a mile away before you go, I wonder if I turned that off, right? I mean, that's how that plays in my head. Like, Yes, that's exactly what happens. And that happened this morning because I actually straightened my hair this morning. And I was able just to say, this happens every time I do this, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to trust myself. And I'm going to not turn around, but I mean, that urge to turn around is, is there. And that's yeah. a human. So somebody, somebody with diagnosable symptoms of OCD would turn around in that moment. That's what you're yes. saying. Because that would be the, the certainty yes. behavior. Yes. Cause there's kind of this need, like I have to have uncertainty. I cannot move forward without it. And, um, and so that, that's kind of where we kind of differentiate between typical obsessions and compulsions that we kind of all engage in versus like actual diagnosis. And in that situation, Mm -hmm. it would be time consuming. It would interrupt my life because then I would be turning around uh, 
like basing all that traffic, like delaying my arrival at my destination and stuff like that. And that's where it kind of becomes um, impairing and causing a lot of distress in my life. So I guess then one of the elements is, as I'm listening, the thought and behavior that actually is impairing, not just, right? So the behavior or the soothing behavior, as I'm calling it, what do you call it? Yeah. I call them compulsions or sometimes we call them safety behaviors. Sometimes I call them like your... I usually like to use the words that my clients use. And so sometimes I'll like refer to them as routines. Sometimes they'll say like, oh, like my like behaviors or whatever. Um, it kind of doesn't matter what we call it. it um, I like right. to speak other people's language because then it sticks better for them. And uh, I agree. Yes. I agree. So I love this conversation. Where does ERP then come in? Because I imagine that when you're dealing with OCD, you're particularly first in ERP as well. And can you explain what that initial stands for? Yeah. Yeah. So that's exposure and response prevention, which is the gold standard treatment for OCD. Uh, so essentially, if you kind of think about OCD as being a cycle, so something happens, it triggers you to have the obsession. So that thought, image, or feeling, which is going to elevate your anxiety. And then your brain's going to say, man, this is a real threat. We have to like do something. It's going to, um, most of the time, all of our, all of our brains kind of focus on separating real threats from false threats. And our brain's kind of constantly doing that with OCD. Our brain is going to label this obsession as being a real threat to us. And it's going to respond by activating our fight or flight. Right. And then, like I mentioned before, because none of us like to feel anxious, we're going to try to escape that feeling as quickly as possible. And the compulsions are helpful in the sense that they take away your anxiety pretty quickly in that moment. But it's only temporary because the cycle will start all over again next time you have a trigger. So exposure and response prevention is essentially a way that we are reversing that uh, cycle. So if we take away the compulsion, that gives us an opportunity to realize that the bad thing OCD is threatening isn't actually happening. And that takes away the faulty belief that is supporting the fact that this is a real threat. I have to respond to it. So you can kind of get to the point that you can have intrusive thoughts. You can have those intrusive images and feelings and recognize that they're just silly intrusive thoughts and I don't have to pay attention to them. So much like when you're meditating, on a, on a very different level, when you're meditating and the thought comes and the, the instruction is let the thought go by, don't, don't attach to the thought. It sounds like a rigorous way of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So mindfulness is actually a really great tool that I use a lot in support of the exposure and response prevention. So being able to say like, oh, I feel uncomfortable right now, but let's just keep moving with our lives where our lives doesn't, doesn't have to stop in this moment. Um, and I don't have to engage in a compulsion. I can just say like, mm, no, thank you, brain, and move on with my day. Um, and so that's really the ultimate goal is to be able to just recognize these are silly thoughts, silly feelings, images that kind of pop in our heads from time to time. Um, but it there's a lot of act that kind of comes into uh, ERP as well of being able to, I, I help patients a lot, kind of identify what's your value, what's something that you want to be doing, and how's OCD getting in the way? Um, and so when we feel uncomfortable, can we take a step towards the value and away from the OCD? And that can be really helpful for people to kind of have that motivation or that valued activity they're walking to instead of just kind of facing your fear and not kind of seeing the bigger picture in that moment. Just a question. Sometimes I see people who get really close to that precipice of leaving behavior behind and yet they then cling back to the behavior not just there i'm wondering how much ambivalence is there about walking away from ocd on some level because i think that must come up for that disorder as well as others it's a known yeah Yeah. definitely i see it a lot because there's are some aspects of OCD that can be beneficial to certain people. Like I see this a lot with perfectionism. So um, individuals who are like writing and rewriting and um, spending a lot of time 
on their assignments get straight A's. They get um, accolades at school or at work. They're like, get the attaboys and stuff. And so there's a lot of reinforcement there or um, with contamination OCD, for instance, like if you wash your hands frequently, that does actually decrease your likelihood of you getting sick. And so right. their OCD does have kind of a kernel of truth where it starts. And so that that can kind of be a really hard place to, um, uh, that's where you kind of see a lot of the ambivalence and a hard place to kind of strike the motivation um, because there is part of uh, OCD that does kind of make sense. And there are sometimes parts of it that are reinforced that do um, get people who don't know that you're struggling with OCD do kind of like praise you for that aspect of yourself or much like eating disorders in some realms. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very similar to eating disorders where people like you look so good. And then that kind of reinforces that uh, desire to continue with that behavior. So you can see that a lot with OCD and, um, and uh, especially because there are some, a lot of superstitions that kind of uh, are associated with OCD. So I used to work in LA and um, saw a lot of people who are in Hollywood and Hollywood's very superstitious and it was so reinforced in that environment that it was really hard to kind of give me an example of um, what a superstitious OCD symptom would look like. Yeah. Uh, so like, Oh, if I, this is kind of something that a lot of people do, whether you have OCD or not is like, um, let's say I did really well on an interview. I'd say like, Oh yeah, I think it did went really well. I think I got the job. And then I would have to knock on wood to jinx it, to make sure that I'm not jinxing it, like kind of undo that. Uh, so you kind of see that a lot. And I mean, people kind of hold on to that and kind of say like, Oh, this good thing happened because I didn't jinx it or because I did this ritual and they're not really able to see like, no, that good thing happened. You made a good grade on your test because yeah. you're smart because you prepared for it. Yeah. Um, and so because of that kind of like just coincidental happenstance, that kind of also makes it a little tough sometimes. I can see that. What are some of the particular focus of certain kinds of OCD. I know that there is, you know, we had one guest who talked about his notion that he was harming people when he was behind the wheel of an automobile that he had run somebody over. So can you talk a little bit about those sorts of specifics? Yeah, so OCD can manifest in a variety of ways. I think that we as a society are very kind of attuned to like contamination OCD. Um, I think a lot of people can kind of understand what that is or perfectionism or people who are like very orderly and organized and stuff like that. Um, but OCD can really attack anything that um, is important to us. So we consider OCD as being ego dystonic, which means that it is so against who you are as a person. It's going to attack the things that matter the most to you, that the mere fact that something could happen in that area is so scary that that's how it gets its power. So for new moms, for instance, they might have um, a form of OCD called harm OCD, where they think like, oh man, what if I accidentally harm my child? Or they might have pedophilia OCD, which is uh, kind of the, the intense fear that I might be sexually interacting with a child, or I might be a sexual predator. Um, some people might have uh, thoughts of what if I lose control and hurt myself? So that's kind of like a suicidality fear. Um it can really manifest in uh, any other ways as well. Um, what you mentioned before is what we call hit and run OCD, like the fear that I'm hitting somebody while I'm driving, or I'm uh, afraid that I have hit somebody and then run, like don't know that I did and then flee the scene and get into trouble. Um, there's also just kind of fears that if I'm away from mom and dad, something bad's going to happen to them. Or if I don't do these rituals and, um, there'll be an intruder who comes into my house and things like that. Um, it, it really can, the, I've seen a variety of uh, fears and yeah. everyone's fear is so different because it, of that ego dystonic piece that it has to be something that's really, truly important to you. And because we're all so diverse in what's important to us. Um, and also it's, I think heavily impacted by society. So around like the black lives matter movement, I saw a lot of individuals with kind of racism, but, fears of what if I accidentally offend somebody or what if I post something that like people think is offensive and so it can kind of really manifest in a lot of different ways um but I like the expression the doubting disease because in each of those examples all it's 
doing it's as if it's saying don't trust yourself and then the answer is but you can right there is that dialogue that must go on as they get well yeah which is the most rewarding part i think of working with this disorder is the fact that by the end of your treatment you you get to see this person go from completely um doubting themselves doubting everything about themselves to then being like i i got this like i'm a good person and kind of seeing somebody actually realize like i'm a i'm a good person it it can be really uh really powerful and i feel like that's just kind of one of the most amazing things about erp wonderful well, thank you, Ali. I appreciate you taking the time to talk today about OCD and some of the treatments. I have learned something and I'm pretty sure that our audience will too. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for joining this webinar. Tune into more webinars and sign up for our newsletter at O'ConnorPG.com.